Welcome to Waterways and welcome to the St. Lawrence River. My father-in-law joined me on the 29-year-old pocket cruiser a few days ago in Brockville, Ontario, and we are en route to New York City. Thus far, we've gone through a stretch of the St. Lawrence Seaway, detoured to Oka to get a stern thruster and a swim platform extension put on, and transited the historic Lachine Canal right through old Montreal, dodging the low bridges that limit vessel size. Now we're in the wide open river, but not for too long. About 40 nautical miles, taking us quite a bit north, actually, where you reach the Richelieu River, with our goal being 52 nautical miles from the end of the Lachine to the St. Ours Canal. The mouth of the river at Sorel Tracy is dominated by an industrial port, but almost immediately, once you go under the Turcotte Bridge and through the remains of the old South Shore Railway Bridge, it feels like cottage country. As you rip along the river, keep an eye out for small car ferries and for other boats, as this can be a popular waterway. 12 nautical miles south of Sorel Tracy, you come to the St. Ours Canal, which is quote unquote, just a single lock and dam, but this was vital to link the St. Lawrence and Hudson Rivers. And it's the first of 22 locks we'll be going through to get to the Hudson. It can be a little tight based on timing, but it's possible to do the St. Ours and the Lachine Canal in the same day. Continuing south, you'll have another cable car ferry crossing at St. Denis or Richelieu to watch for. And make sure you give them lots of room because that cable will be near the surface in front and behind of the ferry as it pulls itself across. And just six nautical miles later, another ferry at St. Charles to Richelieu. So we could have kept continuing to Canal de Chambly and tied up there, but we also need gas. So we decided to make it as close as we could because there's a marina right by here that has gas and in between these two islands is an anchorage. So now we're hooked. There's a rule of thumb, like if you're in really calm conditions and it's just sort of day anchoring, five to seven times the length of the depth of the water you're in is what you should do. Most people don't, and a lot of the time, most of the time, that's fine for your day anchoring. But if you're gonna sleep overnight, you're gonna wanna make sure you have a good and proper hook and make sure that you can swing because even though this is a river, there's no tides, there's a current that's pretty predictable in terms of direction, you still wanna make sure that if waves come, you can swing on your hook and not hit any land. That seems to be the case, so time for steak. The next morning started by giving the credit card a workout. Humor, of course, being the essence of any boat trip. And here too is a great visual of the current we're fighting against as we head south. But then we had a magic run in almost perfect conditions towards Mount St. Hilaire. And when you're boating in a river, slow down when you pass the marina so you don't slam the boats with your wakes. Most places have a sign, but you shouldn't need one. One section where the pucker factor can be a little high is McMasterville. And that's because the channel is quite small under the rail bridge and you've got to stick to the starboard side. This would feel pretty tight in a larger vessel. Between St. Ours and the start of the Chambly Canal is about 28 nautical miles. And while waiting for the green light, this is a perfect place to pump up the new fenders after I got chirped on social media for the dirty old ones that came with the boat. The start of the 180-year-old Chambly Canal is three flight locks, which can be a tight squeeze with big modern boats filling it up, but the staff are great, as are your fellow boaters. Be prepared to be in photos here, though. It's a popular tourist spot, and who doesn't want to come see the boats? Well into our second province, we are just hours away from entering America and adding a few states to the list of destinations we'll hit on this journey. Time for another safety segment. I got my friend Craig Hamilton back. How are you? Wonderful. Thank you for having me. 
Licensed captain, 200 tons, master instructor, trains all kinds of people in a very big, important organization. So the right man to talk to. So this is a personal flotation device. Is that uh, correct? That's correct. So that's the choice. We have the ones that can be worn around the waist, which yeah. is really uh, popular with uh, like fishermen, for example. It keeps their shoulders free. Okay. And then we have the type like I'm wearing here today, which is worn like a personal flotation device. Right. So same thing. Like So this, this is, it's got the Transport Canada and U.S. Coast Guard. Like This is a legitimate PFD? Correct. So uh, the rules here in Canada is that everybody must have a, a, an approved and working flotation device that fits properly. So these can be adjusted for any size of person, but we still have to remember, you have to be 16 years of age or older to wear either of these inflatable devices. Right, that's important. Yep. All right, well, I'm gonna test this out. Uh, it says jerk to inflate, so that must be me, because you are no <laughs> jerk. Stand back, I'm being safe. And now, I see it here, so up. Look, they got the instructions right there. So up, over my head. Oh, look at that. Yeah, and as you see, this is all in front of the person so that they float face up. Also, here's the canister, and it's gotten very cold now because it's released all of the gas. Oh, yeah, wow. Yep, so when you're ready to repack all of this, the instructions are on the bag how to do so, and you would just replace the canister, which you can purchase at marine stores. This is the same situation where it will open up and inflate around you, very similar to like an airplane style right. life jacket, and then you would replace the canister afterwards. And push this to deflate it? Also, that is uh, uh, to be able to fill it back up again. So if it starts to lose air, you don't have anything left in the canister, you can manually inflate. Okay. Let's see how yours works. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad. All right, well, now I gotta repack this. That'll be on another episode. <laughs> That's pretty cool. PFDs are mandatory in the St. Lawrence Seaway locks. And while they aren't mandatory in every canal, it is a good idea to wear them there can be a lot going on, and no one plans on having an accident after all. The Chambly Canal is 12 nautical miles long. It varies a little based on traffic, but you can count on somewhere between three to five hours from start to finish to get through all nine locks and past all 10 bridges. Eight locks down on the Chambly Canal, one more to go in, uh, I believe, St. Jean's Michelou, uh, but it's, I don't know, like a 15K putt at 10 kilometers an hour. Very cool, very cool scenery, by the way. It's really narrow at some sections and all that stuff. And it also gives you time if it's a warm, sunny day like today to dry things like your shower towel. If you're gonna dry it in the sun, you always give your boat a superhero cape. Nailed it. From the end of the canal in St. Jean sur Richelieu, it's 19 nautical miles to the international border at the top of Lake Champlain. Make sure you call in or use the app to register your entry anytime you cross an international border. And if not, the very first thing you should do when you arrive and tie up at your destination is to call in with the authorities and sit tight until they say you are cleared. You should also fly a courtesy flag. At the stern of your vessel is the flag that your vessel is registered in. But when in foreign waters, fly that country's flag as well when possible. Speaking of the border, this here is known to many as Fort Blunder. Because thanks to a surveying error, the first American fort that was built here in the early 1800s meant it was actually built on the Canadian side of the line. And it wasn't until 1842's Webster-Ashburton Treaty that the issue was corrected and this new existing fort, Fort Montgomery, was built in what was now American territory. Heading south into Lake Champlain, you have lots of options on both the western New York side or the eastern Vermont side, the border going right down the middle of the lake. But we decided to race the sunset again and head for Burlington, Vermont, the biggest city on the lake. Including the Great Lakes, Lake Champlain is the 13th largest lake anywhere in the United States, and it stretches more than 100 miles long north to south, so you've got to respect the wind, because if it's blowing due north or due south, this could get quite choppy. But for today's run, it's picture perfect. And we arrived at a location beautiful enough that it could kick off the start of a boating show's opening credits. 
Hypothetically speaking, of course. The temperature's rising, you're feeling the heat. Burlington, Vermont is home to about 44,000 people, and a ton of them are boaters. There are multiple marinas that coat the shoreline here, and plenty of places to go around Lake Champlain itself. Before fueling up, pumping out, and casting off, it was a short walk into town to grab breakfast, and then head for the next major canal journey, the Champlain Canal. But first, it's a heck of a run to get there. 62 nautical miles from Burlington to Lock 12. And it was right around here, under the bridge by the Champlain Memorial Lighthouse, formerly a working lighthouse from 1858 to 1926, where I crossed the 1,000 kilometer mark from the start of this journey in Toronto. The southern end of Lake Champlain is an absolute blast to boat through. Beautiful winding stretches till you get to Whitehall and Lock 12, the first of 11 that will go through. And no, you're not mistaken, nor am I. I did say lock 12 and that there are 11 locks total. That's because lock 10 was apparently never made. And I've yet to hear a compelling argument as to why they simply didn't renumber the locks, but what can you do? The Champlain Canal system opened in 1823 and is about 52 nautical miles long, but the lockages are what limit your transit time. Lock C9 marks the peak of your journey in a sense. From here you go from up to downbound lockages. For us, we were able to get as far as Fort Edward, which isn't the middle, but as far as we could get before the Lockmasters called it a day. I'd like to say we totally avoided the rain, but I'd also like to say I'm on a 94-foot Viking, but here we are. Still, this was a great stop. Nice mooring wall with free power and water and restaurants and a brewery nearby. Every canal seems to have slightly different operational processes. The seaway locks, for example, provide lines for recreational boats that they keep off to the side, while the Parks Canada canals in Quebec have you tie up the floating docks within the locks. Here in the Champlain Canal, they provide lines, but they're generally hanging in the water, and so when the basin is full, it means they're just sitting there getting rather nasty, so gloves become a vital part of your equipment. Almost as valuable as an actually useful swim platform or a stern thruster. Total game changer way safer and way more confidence and safety is key i did love that at each lock there are clear details as to how far the next one is so you could keep track of your progress i wish that were standard in every canal like most historical waterways recreational boating was not a consideration in the construction of this even though that's what it evolved to primarily serve 200 years later However, there is still some commercial traffic along here and you may be squeezed over to the side to let a barge through. The beauty of the Champlain Canal is that in between some of the locks, when you get into the Hudson River section, there effectively is no speed limit if you're on a bigger boat. The speed limit being 45 miles an hour. Uh, we are nowhere near that, but it allows us to skip ahead of that sailboat, as lovely as they were, and put some water behind us. The other benefit of having to have a couple people on board is that you have a second set of eyes, especially because the channel, though well marked, sometimes weaves a little bit. You got that red up there? Nice. Clouds are clearing up. Love it. Next stop, Albany. Knock on wood. Continuing south, you exit the Champlain Canal, but you're not quite done with the locks. A little under five nautical miles after Lock C1 in Waterford, you come to the giant Troy Federal Lock and the city of Troy, New York. On the other side of this is the Hudson River and theoretically smooth sailing until New York City. There are so many detours and options and stops along the way that you could do 
that the only way to give actual distances are to use solid landmarks, like the start of the canal. So that's why I'm giving those key distances. And from the start of the Chambly Canal to the start of the Champlain Canal, you're looking at 118 nautical miles. Then, from the start of the Champlain Canal to the Troy Federal Lock, about 65 nautical miles in total. And from exiting the Lachine Canal in Montreal, all the way here to Troy, we've traveled 265 nautical miles in three days and got through the 22 locks between Montreal and Manhattan. And just to get a little closer, we finished the day with a run down the Hudson, about eight nautical miles to Albany, the state capital, and tied up at the Albany Yacht Club for a few days. Coming up next, New York City. The unusual weather continues. Return to Albany after a much needed weekend break at home with the fam and see my son. Back underway on the Hudson River. Uh, allegedly, it's not gonna rain. It seemed to got that out of its system last night, but it's clearly cool and uh, overcast. The good news is there's nothing between me and Lady Liberty but about 140 nautical miles of Hudson River. No more locks, no more lift bridges. It should be a easy, straightforward run. Of course, uh, we are now in tidal waters. There's a lot of logs and debris in this, so it's not quite as straightforward as aiming the pointy part of the boat where I want to go. Um, I've got the chart going. I spent last night reviewing it. Just will take a little while. And my father-in-law went back home after helping out with those locks. Again, reminder, if you are going to do this, you need two people for the locks at a minimum. Sometimes that is required by the lockage systems. And in general, it's just good practice because locking through by yourself is not particularly fun. So onwards, southwards. This run may have been my favorite stretch of the entire journey. Now, that could be because it was the final stretch, or that Manhattan's iconic skyline was the reward, but I think a big part of it was what I got to see along the way. On a map, the Hudson runs pretty much north-south, but the channel weaves a little bit, just enough to keep it interesting. And you have towns and cities that dot the shoreline. There are railway lines that run along the shoreline of the river on both sides at points, and no shortage of boats to check out. For example, I saw someone moving my yacht north. I mean, if I'm being honest, I'd take the tender they're towing. New York City has been a commercial hub for centuries, and the Hudson was the original highway in these parts. So there was a lot of shipping back in the day, which means a lot of lighthouses were needed to mark safe passage, many of which remain standing. And there are some massive bridges, including this one, the Mid-Hudson Bridge of Poughkeepsie, which, and I hope you're sitting down for this, you'll find midway between Albany and New York City. After about 72 nautical miles, the old girl was a little thirsty, so I pulled in a Newburgh Yacht Club for a top-up of gas. And then just a few miles south, while using a UV net gator as a hat because my baseball cap kept blowing off, and air drumming like a boss, because I can air drum like a boss. I'm bored, and I wanted to relive the glory days of the high school band. Here too, you'll find some unique sights, other than whatever's going on there. Starting with Bannerman Castle on the east side of the river, built by Scottish businessman and munitions dealer Francis Bannerman, but now owned by the state and offering tours and dinners. At the next bend in the river is West Point, home to the famed United States Military Academy and the oldest continuously operating army post in the U.S. dating back to 1778.
And you can forget whatever the official start of Manhattan is on a map. From a boater's perspective, you can consider it beginning as soon as you pass under the George Washington Bridge. That's when things get really busy. There's commercial traffic, tour boats, high-speed water taxis, and ferries that seemingly run non-stop. So be ready to deal with some big waves. This whole journey began with a simple idea, proving that big adventures can happen in a smaller boat and that you don't need to spend a million dollars to really live the best boating life. It took 12 days of travel, more than 750 nautical miles, which is about 1,400 kilometers. But I made it from Toronto to Montreal to New York to, well, near New Jersey. But Liberty Island is considered New York, and I tried to match her. And there's a lot to learn about these waterways, the science of boating, and the history of New York. And I got the perfect guy for that. Hang on a second. Let's go get him. Steve, we're just kind of like cruising. I'm going to record just for the sake of recording, but that's yeah. actually set up a proper interview when we get over there. Yeah. Uh, Do you spend time on the water at all, Neil? Uh, Dr. Neil, to you. No, <laughs> <laughs> Who said you could make eye contact? <laughs> <laughs> I guess now I got to get home. Yeah, that ferry's coming. <laughs> I'm gonna do that one again. 